during week 243 of Brada's Branded Thoughts. A look at Iowa's offense, ranking each position on the offensive side of the football as we approach the start of fall camp, plus an exclusive interview with an incoming transfer. That's wide receiver Jacob Gill, who followed his good buddy, Brendan Sullivan, to Iowa City. All that coming up during week 243 of Brada's Branded Thoughts. This is from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Before we get to our content for today, I want to take a moment to remind you, if you're not following this show on social media, the question is, why not? Check us out on Instagram. We have got just short of 600 followers on Instagram. It took me a long time to get with the program with Instagram. Please help me make up for lost time. The goal, let's get to 1,000 followers by the time we hit the season. So we've got about 9,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. We've got plenty of people watching our shows and listening to them via podcast. Please head over to Instagram. It's at from the Hawkeye on Instagram. You see the profile here on your screen at from the Hawkeye on Instagram. Also, here's the other goal. We're trying to get to 1000 followers on Facebook, the Facebook page from the Hawkeye of the storm. We're sitting right at 700 followers, content, short form content and posts regarding upcoming content basically around the clock on both networks. So please follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. Let's hit 1000 on each platform before the start of Iowa football 2024. So week 243 of Brada's branded thoughts. This is my personal podcast that has evolved over the years into a mainstay here from the Hawkeye of the storm. And once again, we're counting down the days until the start of the season, and we're really counting on the days to the start of fall camp. we got Big Ten Media Days next week. Big 12 Media Days already in the books. SEC has already had their media days. Seems like a convention for the Southeastern Conference. Of course, the Big Ten's Media Days will take place in Indy, so there should be plenty of talking points after we hear Kirk Ferentz and the selected players speak to the media next week. But as it relates to this show, here's what we're going to do. Over the next couple editions of this show, I'm going to rank my position groups on each side of the football. So today, I'm going to talk about offense. I'm going to give you my biggest strength on the offensive side of the football heading into the season. Of course, this is all subjective, but to me, the strongest position heading into 2024. And my biggest weakness might surprise you. We're going to rank all five positions, one through five starting with the biggest strength. And the biggest strength, from my vantage point, without question, is the tight end. That's not going to surprise many people, although Iowa did lose a draft pick in Eric All. They get Luke Lachey back. He, of course, was having a great start to his 2023 campaign before going down with an injury. They'll get him back, and uh, they'll also get Addison Estringa, who relieved both All and Lachey in 23. Number two is running back. They are so deep there. We're going to talk about the depth in a little bit, but it's led by Leshawn Williams, who's kind of the forgotten man at times, although I think he is the starter. He's going to be on the one line heading into the season. Number three, quarterback. Iowa added Brendan Sullivan out of Northwestern. He's a guy who's thrown a good number of passes and has put together a respectable completion percentage at a Big Ten program and assuming Cade McNamara is healthy, better depth there uh, and experience, certainly. But injuries are always a question now with a guy who's had two serious knee injuries. Number four, and now here's where we're going to start surprising people, wide receiver. Now, nobody expected me to rank the wide receiver group in the top three, but I think most people would probably put them at number five. But as I've said before on this show, and I could be getting fooled in all this, but I've got confidence in Tim Lester's ability to get as much as possible out of this wide receiver room. And I actually like the talent they have there. Caleb Brown, Seth Anderson, you know, if he's dealt with some injuries in his first two springs, I've heard great things about Jacob Gill. We're going to hear from Jacob here in a little bit. Jared Bowie really came on late in the year last year. And again, this is a totally different coaching staff from the top down with Bud Meyer, with um, Lester, I mean, those two guys are the bread and butter as it relates to the wideouts. So, you know, Terrell Washington, I think, has got a chance to produce at that position as well, even though he's listed as a running back. And that brings me 
to number five, and that is the offensive line. I'm going to get to that in a second, why I've got them at number five. Let's go back to number one, though. We'll start with tight end. What should we expect out of this room? And keep in mind, this is not an all-inclusive preview, as I do every year. In August, I'll run through every single position, player by player. We'll break down the entire team, and we'll do so with Coach Patterson. So this is just the first of many previews. But as it relates to depth, that's specifically what I want to highlight. As I mentioned, you've got Lachey and Estringa, but you've also got a young guy in Zach Ortworth who played last year, kid out of St. Louis, who did not expect to see a lot of time. But man, true freshman playing at tight end, that is impressive. You look at the rest of this group. Johnny Pascuzzi has also been a starter. Here's a kid who is still listed as a walk-on and entered the transfer portal in the offseason only to leave the transfer portal and return to Iowa. So talk about a top four right there. And then you add a guy like Gavin Hoffman, who's a four-star kid coming in, enrolled early, played in the spring. Of course, Michael Burt, another young guy who I think has a lot of promise. Grant Leaper, same thing. And they tend to get good production and guys that are walk-ons that are ready to produce. So maybe that becomes Jalen Thompson. Maybe it ends up being a guy like Andrew Lynch. I will say this, Hayden Large is listed as a fullback. I think Iowa's going to run less fullback. You may see Eli Miller being uh, at that starting fullback position. I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of the traditional tight end stuff from Hayden Large. So plenty of depth there. And of course, just history tells us, even without Brian Ferentz, this is going to be a strong room. They produce pros year in and year out. So that is why tight end is number one. I mentioned running back. How about this group of running backs? And I thought somebody was going to leave during the offseason via the transfer portal. Somehow, some way, um, Liddell Betts hung on to every running back on the roster. Obviously, LaShawn Williams seems to be steady Eddie. He's the most experienced. Caleb Johnson's the flashiest. He looks the part, right, at what, 6'2", um, what, 225. However, he's been a bit inconsistent, hasn't proven the ability to put his foot in the ground, make guys miss consistently. Then you're talking about a guy like Kamari Moulton, who played last year as a freshman, has gotten bigger. He's one of the biggest weight gainers during the offseason. I mentioned Terrell Washington, who you can split out as a slot receiver, but also is a natural running back. And then Jazz Patterson, who I actually thought might leave during the offseason. He is back. I really like Brevin Dahl. He's coming off a serious injury. They bring him in as a freshman. Max White's got some experience. I guess he had to go that deep. Xavier Williams talked to him recently on a podcast, so they're just really deep at running back. Yes, it's youthful um, experience, but, hey, they've got enough at the top there, and you can go running back by committee, but I also think you got a couple of guys who could end up being bell cows if you need them to be bell cows. Quarterback, mentioned Cade McNamara. Brendan Sullivan, both those guys have played in the Big Ten and thrown for 63 64% through the year plus. Yes, different places. One was at Michigan, one was at Northwestern. K did it before the two serious knee injuries. However, the point is those guys have been efficient. We haven't seen efficiency at Iowa's quarterback position, specifically in that category, pass completion percentage in a long, long time. You talk about Marco Linez, got a little playing time against Tennessee. I put out a video a couple of days ago regarding Jackson Stratton, who was a scholarship quarterback at Colorado State. Iowa brings him in as a walk-on. And then a guy who could be the future, James Rezar. We say that about every quarterback, right? But he is an exceptional athlete at six foot four, and he is now part of this roster. He just enrolled this summer. So they're deeper. They're not real deep, of course. Still a lot of an experience there. They don't have some standout at quarterback. Cade McNamara is not some standout. Neither is Brendan Sullivan. Sullivan was battling for the starting job at Northwestern. But both those guys have proven they can be efficient and productive. And with a better offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach in Tim Lester, I expect that quarterback room, even if they do suffer another serious injury, you hope that doesn't happen. But I expect that quarterback room to perform a lot better. Number four, wide receiver, and I know a lot of people, as I said earlier, expect this room to be the biggest weakness on the team. Caleb Brown is likely going to miss game one against Illinois State. That has not been confirmed by Kirk Ferentz. I'm guessing that will be discussed during Big Ten Media Days next week. 
I've heard really good things about a young man we're going to hear from in just a minute, Jacob Gill. His speed, his route running, his maturity. He's very close to Brendan Sullivan, so keep an eye on the quarterback battle because, hey, that could have some level of an impact as it relates to the pecking order chemistry-wise with the receivers. But those two guys, I think, could end up being your top two guys clearly. And then you have a number of guys battling for that third spot. Seth Anderson started much of last year. You look at a guy like Caden Weijin, walk on from junior college, but he's got really good speed. I expect to see him get some time on special teams, maybe as a punt or kick returner. Dayton Howard is an intriguing name. We haven't seen a lot of him. Jarrett Bowie did play some last year. He's another young prospect. This is his second year. Reese Vanderzee is entering his first year. Uh, he is on scholarship. Alec Wick. Seems like he's been in the program forever. He's a walk-on with experience. Graham Friedrichs, I mean, good on the list. They've got a lot of walk-ons who can at least fill spots if need be. You hope the scholarship guys step up and um, cement their roles and stay healthy. Reese Osgood's another one. Um, Aiden Price is a walk-on. Uh, Alex Eichmann is a walk-on. So anyways, go down the list. And I don't want to forget about Alex Moda. I think he was dealing with some injury last year. He is in his second year, good track athlete, played a lot of quarterback in high school. He is a second year receiver with this program. And KJ Parker is also entering his first year. And I think he fits the mold of a Tim Lester receiver with his size and his strengths. So maybe not a first year guy, but I have more confidence in this receiver room. Again, going back to Tim Lester, what he's done in the past. And I think he's got a couple of guys that he can work with, one being Jacob Gill, another being Caleb Brown, and maybe one of the young guys. We'll see who emerges there. The last position, and that's offensive line. I understand why some people may scoff at this. They've got experience everywhere. And I will take a deep dive into this position group as we approach the season. But the reason I've got them at number five is they've got a lot of experience, but I would consider it to be bad experience. They have not performed. And there were games last year, I think about the game at Wisconsin, the game in Madison, they looked better, knocked off a couple of big runs. Remember, LeSean Williams had a big run. Hey, Caleb Johnson's played really well against Purdue, but they have been so inconsistent. And there have been times where they couldn't protect anybody, whoever it was uh, at quarterback, whether it be Petrus or Hill or even McNamara. When he, McNamara was playing those first three to four games last year, he was getting roughed up a bit. Go back to that, even that Western Michigan game. So they got tons of experience, but we've yet to see it all fit. And they really haven't done anything to address that from a coaching staff standpoint. And I wasn't calling for George Barnett to be fired, but at least they made some adjustment with wide receiver coaching, with quarterback coaching. We're just doubling down on George Barnett and Kirk Ferentz. And if there's one area that we would have expected Brian Ferentz to contribute positively toward, a position group specifically, it'd be the position group where he played at one point up front on the offensive line. He's a former center, and yet they still have struggled for a number of years. They don't run the ball effectively. They're usually bottom quarter, bottom third of the Big Ten in uh, rushing yards per play. And again, pass protection has not been good. I would hope they figure it out. But again, I'm putting more confidence in the coaching staff and the history there than the experience at each position. And so maybe I'm totally in the opposite direction there, but I am just very, very skeptical about this offensive line because it's been so long since we've seen a really good offensive line. I know the 2016 line won the Joe Moore Award. I, I thought that was odd at the time. I remember saying that on this very podcast before I started making this podcast into a platform. I remember saying it to myself. It was probably two or three people listening to the show and I was like, hey, why are they winning the Joe Moore Award? But regardless, this is a group that has to step up, and George Barnett has to step up. If he doesn't, I think he should be out. I mean, if at this point he still can't get things done, I mean, he's been here since 2020. The clock is ticking. And frankly, Kirk Ferentz should be working hands-on every day with that offensive line. I know he's a head coach, but he is an O-line guy. So there's no reason why this O-line can't be better. They are working with a different scheme with Tim Lester. We'll see how that affects everything. That could affect every position in the football field. Um, but uh, that's what fall camp is for and hopefully what spring was for. So uh, those are my five positions, my rankings. 
And next time here on the show, I'll run through my position rankings for the defensive side. Those are easier conversations to have, obviously. Coming up after the break, we'll sit down with Iowa wide receiver Jacob Gill, the Northwestern transfer who is roommates with quarterback Brendan Sullivan, spoke with me for about 20 minutes or so on his decision to join Iowa. Really impressive young man. I think he's going to contribute. We'll be back after this. Let me introduce you to one of the proud supporters of From the Hawkeye of the Storm, Iowa floor covering down in Bondurant. Now, for the last year and a half, you've heard me talk about this great company in the heart of central Iowa. They've got their tough core clicked together, 4.5 millimeter waterproof vinyl flooring. Great for you DIYers out there. But even if you're just a contractor or you need a different type of flooring, they've got you covered, whether it be tile, tile showers, carpet. Give Iowa Floor Covering a chance to serve you better and serve your flooring needs. Visit them online at iowafloorcovering.com. That's iowafloorcovering.com. Or you can give them a call at 515-379-7000. That's 515-379-7000. Thank you to Iowa Floor Covering in Bondurant. Pleased to be joined now by Iowa 2024 Portal Ad, Jacob Gill out of Northwestern. And Jacob, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you and I talked about making this happen. You're now settled in Iowa City, mm-hmm. and you uh, come in to help an Iowa program that needs some help at receivers specifically, and you're going to be a part of a different-looking offense. So we're going to get to that in just a second. So first of all, before we talk the ins and outs of Iowa football, um, congratulations on a new destination. Um, you're, you're from Raleigh, North Carolina. So mm-hmm. I, I gotta want to start there. You come from Raleigh, set all kinds of records down at Cardinal Gibbons down in North Carolina mm-hmm. and end up at Northwestern. Talk about that process, not just recruiting process, but what it was like to, to uh, go on that journey at Cardinal Gibbons. Yeah. So, um, I met, uh, the, the head coach there, uh, coach, Wright, Great guy. Met him, uh, like eighth grade year, um, sat down, Talked with him and I uh, told him I wanted to to come to Cardinal Gibbons uh, and be a start or start as a freshman. I uh, play as a freshman, um, and he saw that that vision as well. So uh, I got into Cardinal Gibbons, um, proved myself. I uh, was was on varsity as a freshman, uh, and then first game actually broke my leg uh, and was out for the season, um, and then ended up bouncing back from that um, and had a breakout sophomore year. Um, and then that's when recruiting, um, started to flow in, um, and things of that sort. Um, and then later down the line, actually, I want to say going into my senior year, um, Northwestern, uh, came in the picture. Um, and from the jump, it was, it was a great feel. Um, a guy by the name of Marty Long, he had my area, uh, recruited me well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I jumped at the opportunity, uh, just a, a mix of education and football, um, surrounding myself around a great staff and um, people. Um, and then I have family in the Chicago area, so uh, it all worked itself out. Um, and yeah, I mean, without uh, the help of Coach Wright, uh, Coach Drew, Coach Lee, all the coaching staff at Cardinal Gibbons, um, and just playing there, being put into a great position uh, to flourish uh, with them in that program. Uh, yeah, I mean, it turned out great. I, uh, ironically enough, so you, you're coming over from the Chicago area, just had uh, Xavier Williams, who's a 2024 high school recruit uh, okay. from kind of Chicago area. And we were talking about athletic background in his family. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not a total surprise that he's got some pretty strong athletic roots. I asked you the same thing before we started recording and you're like, eh, my brother plays basketball. But I did ask you about, hey, do you know who Kendall Gill is? And you said, I think he's a cousin. So, yeah, like down the line. <laughs> people watch basketball back in the early 2000s. They know who Kendall Gill is, but uh, right. you're you're kind of uh, you've kind of went a different path than than most in your family. Is that fair? Uh, a decent amount. Yeah, my, I've I've had a few cousins uh, that have played uh, like football, basketball uh, at the high school level, um, and then like I mentioned, my brother plays college basketball at Fayetteville State, um, previously at Towson. Uh, but my dad and and mom and and their parents. Uh, nothing past high school, so yeah. Let's not understate the the difficulty it is to get to the D one level in any sport. So uh, the right. fact that your brother's been able to accomplish that is is pretty impressive. Were you close to going to NC State 
in doing a little research on you, I just found some things that gave indicators that some pundits thought you were headed to be part of the Wolfpack. Yeah, they uh they were my first offer. Um, and my mom went there, and my high school was literally a five minute walk from the school. So they were, okay. yeah, it was it was a pretty heavy recruitment uh, with NC State. So okay, and and just for people, I'm talking about out of high school. I do want to ask you about your recruitment once you got into the transfer portal. But mm-hmm. as it relates to high school, NC State, Louisville, Northwestern, so you mm-hmm. had Power Five opportunity kind of across the board, different areas. Mm-hmm. Like I had the banner up a little bit ago. Growing up in North Carolina, playing in the Midwest, I know North mm-hmm. Carolina is not like you know deep south of Texas or southern california but the climate's right. different what has mm-hmm. the adjustment been like on the gridiron playing you know in your high school time down in north carolina and come up to the midwest uh yeah i mean the, the games start getting colder uh, a little sooner um but i mean as far as like going, playing football um i mean you get you get used to it you get we practice outside uh all through the fall those those cold mornings um, so, I mean, you bundle up a little bit, but at the end of the day, you got to just go out there and play. So, uh, it's been an adjustment for sure. Um, it's obviously something new, but, um, I mean, when, when you do it for a little bit, you get, you get a little used to it. So, uh, everybody wants to know about track when you're talking about wide receivers and mm-hmm. you have a track background. Mm-hmm. I am the kind of geek that when we're talking about recruiting, I'm like, okay, I got to find what this kid's uh, track times are. So the only Uh, thing I can find for you, and this may not be accurate, but I found a Mm. personal record on a 55 meter dash time of 711. Can you give Uh, us an idea of some speed? I don't know how much you've tested your 40, your 100 meter. That was like, uh, I want to say like freshman, freshman year, sophomore year, something like that. Um, So you've gotten faster since your freshman year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, no. I haven't tested uh, like a 40 or anything like that. I've, I've hit like uh, miles per hour speeds of like 21, 21.5 around there. Um, okay. But, I mean, yeah, other than that, uh, I ran track like just for the training, um, just to like keep my mechanics going during the spring. Um, and, and I speed train a lot. So, um, yeah, that's mainly what I use track for. But wish I competed more um, looking yeah. back on it. But. So that's another wild conversation we could have kind of the interesting backgrounds of some of your teammates on this current team, Seth Anderson, who transferred in, uh, he mm-hmm. was a wrestler in high school. So not everybody oh, yeah. comes from the same, <laughs> the uh-huh. same background as it relates to high school sports. Um, uh-huh. Talk about your experience in Northwestern. So you end up in Evanston and obviously you have uh, a change at the helm with coach Fitz um, and, and the change at the head coaching position. I don't really I'm not asking you so much about what went into your decision to enter the portal and test the waters, but can you just talk about your experience at Northwestern for people that don't know what that's like? Because you, you did talk about the importance that academics played in that decision initially as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Academics and, and the people. Um, I mean, right when I got in, uh, it was just always like a family feel just from the locker room to, to the coaches. Um, just a special group of guys. That was the hardest part about leaving. I was just saying goodbye to to that locker room and to all the brothers that I that I really gathered along the way. Um, but yeah, since freshman year, uh, I've always had a good experience. Um, I mean, the 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 classes were a little tough. Uh, winters were a little tough, um, but you get through it. Uh, the Chicago area is in a bad place to live, uh, so that helped with the experience as well. Uh, I'm a city city guy uh like like going to big cities seeing new things um so venturing out to the midwest to chicago area uh was a challenge but uh, it was a great experience overall for sure so what's the adjustment so far being in iowa city is this like the smallest town you've lived in it definitely is yeah <laughs> when the guys like ask like how, how how have i been getting adjusted uh that's just mainly the the main part uh it's just a more of an open area um, but I mean, in my home, like Raleigh, I live in like the, the open area of Raleigh. So it's a, a little similar, uh, obviously different, but I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been good. I think I like it a lot. Okay. So let's transition. You enter the portal and you obviously had other options in addition to Iowa. Can you give us an idea of some of the schools that were 
in on you? What kind of opportunities did you have opportunities to maybe be closer to home? And was that ever mm -hmm. a thought in your decision making process? And then ultimately, what sold you on Iowa? Yeah, so uh, it was a little quiet at first. Um, I was talking with uh, with Duke and um, Fresno State uh, a little bit. Um, and then Liberty jumped into the into the picture a little bit as well, but um, none with like true genuine uh, interest like Iowa showed. Um, and then just with the opportunity of uh, Coach Lester coming in, um, and just the program and founda foundation that Iowa has set, um, it just felt like the the best fit. It was uh, it just felt like uh, Northwestern all over again. Uh, just the family feel. Uh, type of guys in the locker room, type of guys on the staff. Um, I feel like all contributed, all came in together uh, to unison to, to help me decide. So, Tim Lester's system is something that fascinates me. Can you get a little bit more in depth about how those conversations with Iowa started? Because I'm going to ask you about Brennan Sullivan and the connection there. But um, what do you know about the Tim Lester system and how much contact did you have during the process with Iowa's offensive coordinator? Yeah, when I came on campus, uh, me, and my mom, and excuse me, my dad uh, sat down with Coach Lester, um, and we just talked ball. He just uh, showed like different ways that uh, he can fit guys in the in the certain spots uh, that best suits them. Uh, whether it's they run a route a certain way, or they'll they work better from the slot or uh, from outside. Um, just ways that he can set guys up uh, to win um, and. And that was great to see. So, and as far as getting the ball in your hands, I do think here's one thing that I'll I'll just kind of go on my soapbox just for a second, Jacob, mm -hmm. because um, Iowa fans, we talked about the need that this program has had at receiver for quite some time. And Tim Lester's new to the system; he's bringing in his own standards as it relates to wide receiver play. But John Budmeyer um, and his background as a quarterback mm -hmm. um, I would have to think there's benefits there but he's also never coached the position so how you know was that a concern at all in making the process to a guy who's never actually coached receivers and then how much mm -hmm. do you kind of fall back on hey Tim Lester's got a lot of uh, history at this position yeah I mean like you mentioned just falling back on uh, coach Lester uh, his uh, coach Budmeyer's inexperience with uh, coaching receivers wasn't a, a huge uh, question mark for me just because um, his background with playing the quarterback position. Um, I think he coached the quarterback position uh, as well a little bit. Uh, just gives you gives a receiver insight as to like uh, timing and uh, what like conceptually uh, we're, we're thinking uh, of doing with uh, certain route concepts and, and things of that sort. Uh, so it just opens your your mind more to to different avenues of uh, how the offense can work and uh, different like timings of uh, when you should be open, when this ball should be coming, um, and and just seeing the offense more as a whole uh, versus just as um, a receiver from straight on. So absolutely, I feel like that give, us, a bit. give us an idea um, as to the people who were most heavily involved getting you to Iowa initially. Now, now I'm talking about like the connection with Brendan, but um, what coaches made first contact and have you grown closest to, I guess? Uh, yeah, like you said, Brendan and um, then just Coach Bud Meyer main, mainly uh, and then just recruiting guys as well. But uh, mainly uh, right when uh, Brendan actually reached out to me um, and said that they might, uh, that I uh, have some interest right when he committed. Um, and then right after that, Coach Bud Meyer got on the phone with me. Um, and we didn't really talk much ball. We just uh, and, like talked about like who we are, like introduced ourselves and introduced ourselves. Um, and yeah, uh, just contact with uh, Coach Bud Meyer just was consistent. Uh, I would say the most. So, what did they like about you? What they say in those conversations that that drew them to you? Uh, just the way that I can uh, get open and like the way that I run routes, um, the way that I can make plays, and how they can fit me where uh, wherever they see. Um, in the offense, um, like I mentioned earlier with Coach Lester, uh, whether that be in the slot or on the outside, that I can play both. Um, uh, so, yeah, the big playability. Yep. And so Brendan Sullivan's uh, decision to come to Iowa captivated the attention of a lot of people because here's a guy who 
just like yourself, has Big Ten starting experience mm -hmm. at a position that has had some serious need in recent time. What are Hawkeye fans getting in him? And why were you so on board with following him to Iowa? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, uh, I'll call him Sully. Um, that's one of the most hardworking guys I know. Uh, he's first guy in the building, last one out. Um, he's a hard worker, um, and he's just a hell of a player. Uh, he makes plays. Uh, he's tough. Uh, he can sling it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's my that's my guy. Um, and then just his him committing. Um, we we're actually we were roommates at Northwestern, um, okay. and we're roommates again. Uh, so um, that's that's family. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't hard. Um, like following or following him and and uh yeah committing after so and correct me if i'm wrong as it relates to your career because of the injury your season was cut short you do have two years left correct yes yep so do you plan to take as of right now do you plan to use both of those years as of right now yes okay so. of course uh uh tim lester one thing that i've reflected back on um with his hire here at Iowa is the success he's produced at guys played your position and guys who were woefully under recruited Jacob. So mm -hmm. I mentioned three names before we started recording Jaden Reed, who went on to transfer to Michigan state, put up huge numbers his first year at Western Michigan ends up being a second round draft pick at receiver. Oh, and by the way, he was under six foot tall. Dwayne Eskridge is another one at high school is listed at five, nine. He ends up playing under Tim Lester at Western Michigan just going off for all kinds of uh, stats and, and yardage ends up being a second round draft pick by the Seahawks. And then Sky Moore, who's a member of the Kansas State Chiefs, five, nine and a second round draft pick. And maybe I'm making it too much. Those are, that's just, when you talk about one, sometimes you get an outlier, right? But when you talk about three guys in a relatively short tenure for, for coach Lester at Western Michigan. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if people want to go back and do the research, they can find out, that Coach Lester was working with a number of different wide receiver coaches during that same time period. So the common denominator seems to be the offensive mind of the head coach. So that had to be like somewhat appealing to you. you your clock is kind of ticking with two years left and an opportunity to go play for a guy who's trying to resurrect an offense here. For sure. Yeah, it's it's exciting uh, just to see what he did with those guys um, and just the opportunity and uh, possibility that that can happen uh, in Iowa City as well. Um, yeah, it's very it's very exciting. Tell me about your strengths uh, on the football field uh, and then maybe strengths off the football field. Yeah, I mean, on the football field, I would say I'm a route runner. Um, I, I'm, I get open well. Um, I'm good after the catch. I'm great after the catch, uh, making plays, making guys miss. Um, and then off the field, uh, I'm a hard worker. Um, I like, like Sully, like I mentioned about Sully, uh, just uh, a will uh, to be better than others, um, to outwork others. Uh, just fully committed um, to the process and uh, to being to being great and bettering myself every day. Um, so yeah. And as far as weaknesses, things that you are looking to improve upon, maybe from a strength and conditioning standpoint, or just something mm -hmm. football related heading into the fall. Uh, yeah, just continuing to be explosive, uh, working on my explosiveness. Um, I mean, nobody's perfect, just uh, in all areas. Um, wanting to be just an uh, overall better player um, on the field. Um, and, then, and then off the field, just being a more vocal leader. Um, I've always been known to to lead by example. Uh, guys look at me uh, to, to do uh, when I'm doing the things things the right way. Um, so just being, being more vocal with that, uh, I would say. As far as life after football, uh, I know we talked a little bit about your desire to kind of start your mm -hmm. own venture, your own business yeah. uh, after football. Can you tell people what what life after football looks like for Jacob Gill? I'm sure you'd like to play in the mm -hmm. NFL and prolong that career. For sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, the ball, you got to put down the ball someday. Uh, so when that happens, uh, I want to have my own business one day, or I will have my own business one day, uh, surrounded around developing uh, and training athletes. Um, in my own like facilities, uh, I'll open facilities uh, all over, all over the world. Or I'll probably start like uh, near my hometown, um, where I'll just have like lifetime fitnesses or Planet Fitnesses, just to to give you an image uh, that that are just surrounded around uh, developing athletes um, and uh, training athletes. So, 
And I appreciate it for anybody who listened to this interview. I appreciate Jacob saying not, I want to, I will. Right. So yeah. what will Iowa fans see over these next two years on Saturday from, from Jacob Gill on the football field? Uh, just playmaking and explosiveness, uh, just greatness being, being great, uh, continuously improving um, and bettering myself um, and, and just giving, giving the Hawkeyes everything that I have. So Jacob Gill from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina and transfer from Northwestern. Uh, Hawkeye fans are excited to see you, uh, Jake. Appreciate you being here. And boy, this uh, this summer is going to fly by, man. I, I know you've been through it at a different program, but yeah. uh, I know it's a different perspective from somebody who's on the inside and involved in the conditioning. We've got Big Ten Media Days, and then we've got Iowa Media Days. We'll get a chat with you again there, and then the countdown to uh, fall kickoff. So congratulations on, on coming here and uh, helping a position that's definitely in need. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the black and gold on what, August 31st. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you. Very much appreciate the time from Jacob Gill. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to hit the thumbs up button. That is very important. You may not think it is, but it is. Subscribe if you're a Hawkeye fan, folks. More on the way, including live streams, recruiting interviews, position previews, schedule previews, all of that coming Got about a month and a half, less than a month and a half for the start of the season. Subscribe today, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.